Spoiler warning, the following is an in-depth analysis. If you haven't seen this film, you might want to before watching this review. Since my focus in these reviews is primarily on story analysis, there are elements like score that I sometimes leave out entirely while talking about these films. But music is actually where I'd like to start with the 1968 Italian film Danger Diabolic, or Diabolic as it's pronounced in Italy, because I've never seen a comic book film like this that feels almost entirely designed around a soundtrack. It would be almost safe to say I've never seen a film like this, period. I watched this movie for the first time about a week before writing this review, and I've had the music, especially the main theme, stuck in my head ever since. The song Deep Deep Down is a sensual and oddly soothing song, unabashedly 60s like everything else in this movie, but that fabricated, unreal version of the 60s that only existed in the movies. The soundtrack was written by noted Italian composer Ennio Morricone, who was famous for experimenting with unusual instruments and includes a lot of sitar before the Beatles started using it. The soundtrack was later voted in GQ, third in the greatest film soundtracks of all time, and it was never released in any form, and the masters apparently haven't survived, which is a real shame, because the first thing I wanted to do after 20 minutes of this was jump on Amazon or iTunes and download the music. But the film is also notable as a comic book film, adapting Italy's most popular comic book character, who, according to John Philip Law, who plays Diabolic in the film, is bigger in Italy than Batman is in America, though he said that in 2005, before The Dark Knight broke so many records so take that for what it's worth. It was widely considered one of, if not the movie, most faithful to its comic book source material at the time. We often have the impression that there weren't comic book movies that aspired to look like comics prior to Batman in 1989. Even Superman has a fairly real-looking New York City and is faithful to its story material, but isn't especially stylized, and rightly so, as it wasn't based on something gritty or pulpish. So here I was, thinking film had entirely shied away from comic art stylings or was willing to take the source material seriously in the 60s, and I find out about this obscure film, which really shouldn't be that obscure at all, that takes a lot of its story points and cinematography choices directly from the Fumettis, uh, Italian comics, that it's based on. The DVD was released, as I said, in 2005, and has since been discontinued, so it's fairly rare. I may have never even learned about the film if it wasn't for Justin Cristelli, the real Manos on YouTube, sending me a copy, so I want to really thank him for that, if for no other reason than I actually really enjoyed it. It. And speaking of Manos, I should mention that his favorite series, Mystery Science Theater 3000, did a riff on this film for their last episode, no less. Manos suggested I stay away from that riff before writing this review, claiming the film was too good for that show, and now that I've seen the movie, I totally agree. There's a fascinating commentary with the biographer of director Mario Bava, uh, his name is Tim Lucas, and diabolic actor John Philip Law, who had a long and illustrious international career in films like Barbarella, made at the same time as this one and on some of the same sets, uh, The Golden Voyage of Sinbad, and Coppola's CQ in 2001. We're very fortunate Law had the chance to give his insights on the film before his passing in 2008. Tim Lucas, who wrote one of the most thorough biographies of a Hollywood director ever written on Mario Obama, discusses the reasons the film wasn't especially popular or well-received, and he says a lot of it has to do with the shift away from an interest in the unreal and the fabricated in favor of realism going on in the late 60s. This film wants to be a comic book and goes out of its way not to look real, much like movies like Sin City or 300, except it accomplishes it through wide-angle lenses and fabulous matte paintings created by Bava himself. Bava had an art director, but that guy was mostly Bava's assistant. He was a cameraman and special effects wizard as as much as he was a director. I thought the film looked impressive before I realized how much of these sets were painted. Diabolic's lair especially really holds up. In the wide shots that show its different levels with all of Diabolic's psychedelic decor and the fascinating artifacts he's stolen on his adventures, only a small portion is actually set, and the rest of it is painted. And I gotta say, over 40 years later, I totally fell for it. Not knowing what to expect from an Italian film, I was surprised to find the movie decently accessible. The whole movie is basically a cat and mouse game between Diabolic and his girlfriend, Ava, and the police, represented primarily by Inspector Jinko, and the whole thing is one big celebration of counterculture. Diabolic is all about sticking it to the man. He's been sometimes compared to Robin Hood, but the big difference is that he doesn't steal to give back to the poor, he steals for himself, and just because he can. His main motivation, though, is really love, and that's why 
we're supposed to root for him. He takes from the government because it's oppressive and incompetent, and he does it because he has this blinding love for the gorgeous and intoxicating Ava Kant, his faithful and unwavering lover and partner. He represents a pure motivation. He's an anti-hero and by all accounts a terrorist, really, as John Philip Law points out in the commentary, but he's easier to appreciate, if not sympathize with, than your standard terrorist, because most terrorists are motivated by politics, greed, power, that sort of thing. Diabolic isn't greedy so much as in love. He wants to give everything to the woman he loves, and he's also an incredibly talented spy and thief. Their first plot in the film is to steal $10 million from the government. Diabolic and Ava are never seen spending any of that money, just using it to strategically hide their sensitive parts while they have some really great sex. It's not really about the money, it's more about using these talents because they're great at it, and they can. It's a game for them. Diabolic risks everything for Ava, not because he has to, but because he wants to. And that's how he shows her how much he cares about her. I should mention how incredibly sexual and titillating this film is. It's not erotic, because the producer wanted an international release, so a film that otherwise probably would have had a fair amount of nudity and also a much greater degree of violence is significantly toned down from what it would have been if it was just intended for an Italian audience. Diabolic's signature move in the comics is a knife throw, speaking of violence, which he does in a couple token moments here just for fan service, but mostly isn't unnecessarily violent. Bava felt really restricted by these mandates, something we're all too familiar with with comic and superhero movies these days. PG-13 spawn anyone? And he declined to make a sequel. Given the intense popularity of this character in Italy, and how unique the visual style is, this really could have been the start of a long franchise, I think, at least overseas. The thing that impresses me most about the movie is its minimalism. It looks like a big action movie, but Baba cuts all kinds of interesting corners, like using a cutout picture of an airplane wing to let you know we're in an airport, and using junk that's just lying around to create what's supposed to be sophisticated pieces of technology in Diabolic's lair. Bava was given $3 million to make the movie, and he brought the production in at 400000 He was offered a sequel before the movie was even released because there was enough money left over in the budget for a whole other film. Heck, if he could have kept them all at four or 5000 he could have made a few. Bava makes a really exciting and fun action movie with a high level of intensity and energy, not just with his crazy zooms and wide shots and frantically catchy soundtrack, but most importantly, by making us always wonder how the monosyllabic, wild-eyed diabolic is going to get away with his next heist, or how the heck he's going to get out of Jingo's next sting, or Valmont's mob trap. This is, of course, a completely unrealistic comic book world, but the movie goes out of its way to let you know how warped its reality is, so that when Diabolic starts doing things like walking up the side of a stone castle with suction cups, we'll buy it in the context of this comic book universe. Diabolic always has a clever plot, and he's always resourceful. He doesn't just get away from the police or steal things with no explanation of how he does it. We actually get to see each step in his plans so that when he pulls something off, we can smile and cheer him on, even though he is technically the bad guy. Diabolic has no superpowers, and he's an anarchist. If he's a super anything, he's a super villain in a world with no costumed heroes, and even then, he's only super in that no one else can match his skills as a thief. He has incredible technologies, including an underwater vehicle that helps him steal a two-ton gold ingot after he destroys all the tax offices and forces the government to meld all their gold together and try to sell it so they can afford to continue their government. That's probably the funniest thing in the whole movie, by the way, when the movie's comic relief character, Minister of Finance Terry Thomas, comes on the television and tells the citizens they've lost all the tax records and to please give the government whatever taxes they think they owe, and that he believes in them and they wouldn't let him or their government down. This government that can't catch one guy in a rubber mask who has stolen $10 million, destroyed all their tax buildings, stolen a priceless set of diamonds, and has done more damage to the country than the entire underworld has. The boss of said underworld, who has, by the way, been killed by Diabolic himself. Yeah, I'm sure your citizens will get right on getting you all those taxes they think they owe. But anyway, beyond some gadgets like that, Diabolic relies mostly on his training and resourcefulness. Often, all he needs to get out of a situation is whatever he can find around him, like when he eludes the police after stealing the diamonds from the castle by flinging his outfit into the water with a catapult he finds on the roof. Jinko and his police run off to catch him, but of course, he's just hiding in the dark and in the nude. Tim Lucas in the commentary says that Baba must have related to Diabolic to a degree, and that that's why you can feel so much love from him for the material in this film, because Diabolic 
Bullock does really just what he does, manipulates the eyes with tricks and tries to get away with things. Bava is making a movie in which his protagonist, as a thief, is doing the same thing as Bava is doing as a filmmaker to make us believe the heightened reality of this world. In the castle, Diabolic takes a picture of the room where the diamonds are and places it in front of the security camera so Jinko won't see him steal the diamonds. And all over the movie, Bava is using pictures of places instead of real places to make us buy the depth and scope of what he's trying to achieve. And both Diabolic and Bava do it relatively cheaply, too. I kind of see this movie as basically a Tex Avery or Chuck Jones cartoon, but completely for adults. We see situation after situation where our hero, a socially undesirable underdog, goes up against a figure of authority, wins every time, and rarely speaks. There's a sense of escalation where each situation is more absurd and, in this case, more dangerous than the one before it. What makes it adult, of course, is all the sexual energy and the more realistic violence. There are real things at stake here, too. People actually do get killed. I only compare it to 40s cartoons in that it's all about a series of situations rather than a traditional narrative with a protagonist who has a character arc. Diabolic never changes. Like some Batman stories, that's the point of him. What we're shown needs to change is everything around Diabolic. This world needs to become a place where extreme personalities like Diabolic might consider other avenues of employment or hobby, where they don't feel this intense urge to rob from and damage the government just because it presents itself as so incapable and unworthy of public loyalty that it's like it's asking to be taken advantage of. We're really told nothing about Diabolic or Ava or really anyone else in the film as far as background or real deep characterization. Everyone's an archetype, and it's definitely in a melodramatic mode, though not to the same extreme as something like Sin City. It's not as much about social commentary as the commentary here is paper thin. The Italian counterculture doesn't like its government, they're bad at their jobs and aren't worthy of their power or their tax revenues, and in an escapist setting, it's fun to watch them get embarrassed and lose everything over the course of 120 minutes. As I said, it's more of a celebration of counterculture. Diabolic represents the feelings of the youth in Italy at the time. Most people wouldn't be extreme enough to really want to see a terrorist do the things Diabolic does in the real world, but this is fantasy, and Diabolic is simply a really talented thief who wants to give his girlfriend the world and happens to live in a pathetic state where that's actually feasible for him. The movie is so anti-government that even the mob has more of a sense of honor than the police do. Najinko is certainly a worthy adversary for Diabolic, and the most capable of those working for the law in this film, as he comes up with the plot to work with the mob to try to catch Diabolic, saying it takes a thief to catch a thief, and then when that doesn't work, starts to think resourcefully, kind of like Diabolic, and allows Diabolic to steal the two-ton gold ingot, only to use the radioactive isotopes he secretly placed on it to trace it to Diabolic's lair so he can get everything back that Diabolic stole. He's a pretty no-nonsense detective archetype, but he's a thinker and starts to almost keep up with Diabolic by the end, so he's nearly likable, but the film tries to make him less so by saying he wants Diabolic dead or alive. While even the mob boss, when sending Diabolic into a trap where they arrange to trade the kidnap Ava for the diamonds, gives Diabolic a real parachute and really could have given him a fake. So there's kind of an honor among thieves. It's impossible to watch something like this and not project your own assumptions and expectations onto it. I obviously don't know what it was like to be a kid or a young adult in the 60s during the Cold War era and the Civil Rights Movement, and I certainly don't know what it's like to live in a country that lost a great war, like Italy after World War II, when their hated dictator Mussolini was killed in the streets. I imagine you would have a totally different perspective on society and government and politics and freedom if you grew up in that climate. And so one of the difficulties with this film is that really appreciating what it's doing and who it's for requires a bit of background. I enjoyed the movie as an action picture just sitting down and watching it, and I did like Diabolic, even if I couldn't condone his actions. One thing I really appreciated was how loyal he and Ava are to each other, and how there's never that moment I would expect from most of these kinds of thieving anti-hero stories where the girl would double-cross the hero and take everything, leaving him at the mercy of the police right at the end, the lesson being that crime really doesn't pay, and the system works, and you can't trust any one who believes otherwise. So I really enjoyed Diabolic's sacrifice at the end, where he tells Ava to run once the police have found their underground hideout, buried deep, deep down, and how she doesn't want to go but trust Diabolic, so she does it anyway, only to be reunited with him at the end when we find that Diabolic doesn't really die when he's buried in molten gold and has some kind of trick up his sleeve, which we'll never get to see, but we can buy would make all the sense in the world 
because we've gotten to see him cleverly get out of so many seemingly impossible situations already. I also thought it was very clever to take such an obvious visual metaphor, Diabolic encased by gold, symbolizing his being consumed by his own greed, and to have him get the last laugh at the end anyway. Oh, and I love that trademark Diabolic laugh. In another movie, that would have been the end. The good guys win, and the bad guys get the poetic justice, but not Diabolic. This is his world, and the audience doesn't want the good guys to win, so he beats even irony. So had I just reviewed the movie with none of that background, I would have appreciated it on the level of a fun ride. But I certainly wouldn't have understood the political undercurrent, why Diabolic is blowing up tax offices, and why there's this huge following for a terrorist comic book character in Italy, while most of our most popular superheroes are, well, traditional heroes. Apparently a lot of Italian comic book heroes are this way. So one of the difficulties with watching the movie now is it's very easy with modern and especially American sensibilities to just look at it and say, that's really weird or that's really campy. Visually, I think it really holds up, and I love the feelings of wondering if something was really built or really on location and finding out later that it was fabricated. I like it when a filmmaker can dupe me into believing something, rather than the more common digital effect which looks real enough but can take away from the illusion because you know just how it was done. There's some cynicism in John Philip Law's voice at the end of the commentary when he says, I think actors are slowly being replaced by digital puppets. There's definitely a huge place for digital effects in modern filmmaking, of course, and there have been films that couldn't have been made at all before the advent of computer animation. But I definitely sympathize with where he was coming from, and really enjoyed being surprised four decades after a film was made with these simple little tricks that made me think something was on screen and not even question that it was just a paper cutout or a matte painting. Diabolic has been sometimes criticized as stealing from Bond and riffing on Adam West Batman. There's certainly a great deal of similarities to both. Like Batman, there's colored smoke and a cave and a secret entrance above ground to the cave. There's climbing up a building by actually just crawling on the ground and turning the camera sideways. And there's even a mention of a closed-circuit TV screen, like in the Batman movie. Maybe closed-circuit TVs were just a common tool in these sorts of movies in the late 60s. But this is discussed in the commentary, and I suspected this was the case myself. This film was made in early 1967, and Batman didn't start until November of 66, so no one working on the movie had even had a chance to see it yet. I do think some visual cues may have been borrowed from Bond or homage, especially the underwater scene, and that makes sense to me because Diabolic strikes me as almost the anti-hero Bond. We watch Bond to see how he cleverly finds and dispatches of the bad guys, while with Diabolic, it's fun to see how he cleverly steals from and dispatches the good guys. Lucas also talks about Bond in the commentary and says that Diamonds Are Forever borrows two scenes from Diabolic, the entrance to the cave and the disguise in the crematorium. And importantly, neither of those were in Fleming's novel. It's also interesting to note that mob boss Valmont is played by Adolfo Celli, who played the villain in Thunderball. There is one irritating plot convenience I think Bava could have gotten around by just organizing events differently, and that's the setup by Jinko to get Diabolic to try to steal the diamonds. Jinko gets really lucky that this sting works, given that Diabolic just happens to turn the TV on at the exact point the news is talking about the diamonds and where they are. There's also a strange lack of information for a major plot point, when Ava hurts her arm, goes to the doctor, and gets kidnapped by Valmont. After a heist, she grabs her arm while she and Diabolic are driving and tries not to complain about it, but Diabolic can't help but notice how hurt she is. We don't see what happened to her, and she doesn't tell us, and we see no bruise on her arm or anything. I thought that was an auto mission. The cleverest thing Diabolic does in the movie, for my money, is shoot Valmont with the diamonds he stole, fake his own death, naturally with some Tibetan monk technique he learned, and then disguise himself as a relative of Valmont's in the crematorium and steal the diamonds back from Valmont's incinerated ashes. Isn't that both ingenious and twisted all at the same time? Diabolic is one of those characters that I love because I feel like I shouldn't, but I just can't help myself. And I think that was the point. I'm going to give Danger Diabolic a 3 out of 4. And next week, I'll be counting down my top 10 episodes of Batman Beyond.